Hi there, my name is Kevin Prendeville and I'm going to talk to you today about product development methodologies. What we're going to cover over the next 15 minutes is product development methodology overview. That's the first thing. The second is how have they been evolving over time. And the third are some considerations you should factor in as you're looking at your own product development methodology for your project. Before we get into this, I want to introduce myself a little bit. I'm the global managing partner for Accenture and our product engineering and life cycle practice. And what we do is we help companies with their processes, with their operations, with their technology to get products to market faster from engineering through manufacturing through after sales. And I've been doing that for about 22 years across all kinds of different industries uh, from retail to apparel to high tech to aerospace, semiconductor med products. It's been a blast. And like a lot of you, I'm a mechanical engineer. So I use my problem solving skills every day uh, at Accenture. If you're interested in Accenture, you can see some information here on the side, but we're essentially a $30 billion company, about 400,000 people, and you can click there on the bottom to see more about what we do. Okay, let's talk about the product development methodology. What it is, who uses it, who's involved, why does it exist? So the overall purpose for a product development methodology is to think about what are the stakeholders involved in the end-to-end -end process from the very beginning of coming up with your concepts and ideas all the way through design, launch, maintenance, and uh, the closeout of your product in the marketplace? What most companies have built over the years is a phase gate process. And what phase gates are, are their phases and their gates in between. The gates are checkpoints to help make sure the integrated product team is working together uh, and organized. So an integrated product team are all the stakeholders that need to be involved in getting the product to market. It could be uh, people from marketing, it could be people from engineering, industrial design, manufacturing, sourcing, channels, customers, on and on. Anybody who has a say in what this product should do, how it should behave, and how it should be valued. The other important thing with a product development methodology is the front end of it is very much a funnel. So you have a lot of ideas that come in and you, you need to have a process to figure out how you're going to take those ideas and filter them down to the best ones to move forward with that will have the biggest economic impact for your company and your products. Now something I often get asked is, should a company have just one product development methodology? And the answer is, most likely not. And these are the reasons. If you look at the chart on the left, you'll see there's two dimensions to it. The vertical dimension is size and complexity. So here we're talking about what is the product? Is it a small, simple product with a few parts? Or is it a space shuttle or some type of semiconductor chip with millions and millions of things you need to figure out? And then if you look at the horizontal axis, this has to do with risk and certainty. So is it a product that you know how to design and it's just a matter of doing the work? Or is it something that maybe pieces of the product or the product itself in its entirety are going to push the boundaries of engineering and you need to figure out how to mitigate and manage that risk as you design. So what we tend to see is, depending on what type of portfolio products a company has, they might have multiple methodologies or they might have what's called a scaling plan. And that is taking your phase gate and all your deliverables that are produced during the methodology and the approach and shrinking them for simple products that are not that complex and not that risky or expanding them dramatically when you have something that's very large, very complex, that you're not 100% sure how it's going to work. And that's the graphic you see on the right. So the right are the different types of phase gates, and what you may have is you may actually skip steps um, in certain situations where the product is simply an enhancement, which may be taking a product like this and changing the color or adding a button. That's an enhancement project. Versus designing a way to control a TV with by waving my hand, that's probably a higher risk one that you need to build a whole new a set of technologies to make happen. Let's move on to the next topic. So this is about how product development methodologies have been evolving over time. So as I mentioned in my intro, I've been working with some of the world's leading companies for over 20 years, and I've seen their methodologies change uh, as time has moved on. So let me take you back in time a little bit um, with how the methodology started. So if you look initially, they were very much engineering centric, which was the engineers were getting together, they were designing the product, and they were very much focused on the physical element of the product. And the key there was making sure that you were designing it so it would fit together, so that it would actually work, 
And the main thing with the phase gate at that point was how you allocated capital. Now the risk in a situation like this is you've designed it, but as it's time to build it, maybe you can't actually build it either at all or in an efficient manner. Or if you're trying to service it, maybe it's not maintainable. Or if you're trying to put it out through your customer channels and distribute it, maybe it can't fit in a packaging box, etc., etc. So there's a lot of downstream considerations from additional stakeholders that need to be factored in when you're doing design. And that's what happened to methodologies as they evolved. So they started with the design world, and then over time you added the downstream constituents or stakeholders that play a part in bringing the product to market. Things like tooling, sourcing, cost management, supply chain, all of the things that take from going to the design, to the build, to launch, throughout the whole entire process. Now this is an important slide as well because it's not just bringing in more people, but products themselves have been evolving a ton over the last 20 years. So if you look at the blue up on top, that's the product. And the darker blue in there is software. So if we went back in time, we said that there was a lot of products that were standalone, and the amount of feature set that was delivered of value that was based on software was usually pretty low. They were more physical in their nature. And then the green on the bottom, these are the ecosystems or the infrastructure that the product relied upon. And what you found back in time was the product and the infrastructure were very much separate. You might buy a Palm Pilot, if anybody remembers those type of things. That was a standalone product. The company designed it, they built it, they shipped it, you used it, and it basically existed by itself. But over time what's happening is the blue and the green are very much intertwining. So the product and the ecosystem is connecting. The percent of software that makes up the product is increasing dramatically. And the third thing is people want to buy products, not so much for the product themselves, but the service outcome that they provide. So let me give you an example here. Cars used to be very much standalone, and there wasn't a ton of software in them. Now you look at a car, and the infotainment systems in them deliver a tremendous amount of the, uh, the functionality that you may find in a car. There's all types of control systems that are there now that figure out the brakes and the engine and so on. So the percent of software has gone up a ton. As it relates to infrastructure and ecosystem, staying on the car example, if you think about Tesla, that car in itself is the product, and it's a very fascinating product, but the ecosystem they had to develop in parallel was essential. And for that, the example would be the supercharger uh, network. The more supercharger network that's there, the green, the more powerful the blue is. So these things are very much coming together, and therefore, as you're thinking about your product development methodology, there might be ancillary and tertiary parts of your product that need to be developed to support the core product in the first place. Another great example would be the phone you're probably using. The phones themselves are interesting, but without a Google Play or an Apple Store, you know, they aren't nearly as powerful as they were. So that's part of that ecosystem you need to factor in as you're designing your product and your methodology. Some other things that are changing how products are developed and the corresponding methodology are some techniques and also some capabilities. So if you go back in time a bit, there wasn't a tremendous ability to do digital design and to do digital testing and simulation. But what we have now is we have a fantastic ability to design the product uh, in a virtual state, test it, get customer feedback, get performance feedback, and make changes to it essentially without having to create a physical prototype, any tooling or anything like that. And that allows for much quicker feedback loops and development cycles are there. The other thing we see is, as I mentioned before, the software piece of it or the systems piece. Even if you're designing something like a building or a bridge, you may have considerable amount of software now in there for control systems or IoT sensors that might tr check and track how a building is fatiguing over time. These are things that you would have never factored in many years ago, but now these new technologies have to be embedded into your product and the methodology. And then the whole value stream. So as I mentioned before, people used to buy products, but now they tend to buy outcomes. Right? You used to buy a car, now people are more interested in transportation right? so, and mobility. So they may buy a lease of a car, a fraction of a car, they might just use Uber all the time. You know, these are different things you need to factor in as you're thinking about what problem am I actually trying to solve for the customer. 
And what this leads to is you can get into now uh, a network that essentially is evergreen. So I, we had the linear process in the prior slides where you're walking from idea through design, through launch, and then end of life. In reality, you have a lot of products now that have a very long lifespan, number one, or number two, have the ability to be updated in the field through software upgrades or some type of retrofit that's important. So what you see now, instead of a linear flow, it's more of a circular flow where all the constituents and stakeholders you can see here on the outside contribute to the process. The process flows more in a circle and ideally your methodology and your process is all tied together with a single set of data. All right, now that we've covered what is the product development process and how it, that it's been evolving over time, there's some considerations you want to factor in as you're looking to design or refine your own for your project. And as we look at these, there's a number of them. Some are related to the product itself and some are related to the market. So let me walk through these individually and give some examples that are out there. So first is market. Is your product something that's sold to customers or sold to business? Is it a mass-produced product or is it something that's bespoke for a single situation? You need to think about what is the actual use case, what is the market, what is the scaling and the volume you need to have, and where are you in the market? Are you a premium product that's trying to be differentiated? Are you the low-cost player that's the me-too product? All of that will factor into your voice of customer and how you design for your stakeholders to try to hit that market and dominate that position. The second that relates to that is, is the customer. So who are your buyers? Who is your customer? And then who is your user or consumer of the product? And they may actually be different people. You may have one group that buys the product and a second person that uses the product. You know, this is the case you see with, uh, with toys often where the parents buy the product but the parents, not always, but sometimes play with the toys, but it's usually the kids playing with the toys and therefore you have a different consumer versus a uh, buyer. Location is important as well if you're thinking about not just your product but also your team. Some of the companies we work with have uh, tens of thousands of engineers all over the planet and they're trying to figure out how to work together as a team following the sun and moving the design around to get maximum efficiency and maximum effort out of the day. If you have a distributed team that's distributed around the planet or maybe just around a building, it's a much different approach than if you're all sitting in a room together. In addition, if you're, uh, you have different languages, if you have different uh, metric system versus a, a British system, these things can all factor into you know, how you might actually design and document the product. Capital is a fourth one. And this is critical. So some, some products are very capital light, like software. Right? You can design software, you can update software, you can change it, and it doesn't have a huge capital expense. And then the great thing about it is you can scale it. If you want to send more and more copies of the software out, it typically doesn't cost you a whole lot. Other type of products are extremely capital intensive. If you think about anything that's kind of heavy to pick up, right? a car, a train, a plane, these products are very complex from a standpoint of designing, but once you start designing it, you're investing in tooling, you're investing in materials, you're investing in inventory, and all that takes money. Right? So when you have that type of product, when you have a mistake in it, there's a lot of capital that gets expended because you have to redesign the product, the tooling, maybe scrap some inventory, and so on. So your methodology to support that might be more front-loaded to make sure that you're not wasting money or introducing risk. So capital is important. Complexity. I think you remember a few slides back we had two dimensions of methodology. There was the size and there was the risk. Right? So with size and risk, as those increase, complexity increases. The more complex a product is, the more important you have a methodology to help contain that complexity so you can manage all of the moving parts, all of the players, all of the constituents and stakeholders that will factor in. Platforms. So platform is an important thing for cost savings. And the concept of a platform is, instead of designing 15 different products, what I'll do is I'll design a platform and then put small changes on top of that to create derivatives. The good news about that is then each individual product I design is actually much cheaper. But it's a different mentality if you think about how do I design a platform first 
and then design individual products on top of that versus doing individual products by themselves. So the methodology here is important to think about am I taking a platform strategy to my product so I get future benefit from the platform or is that not important and I can just kind of single-handedly and single-mindedly focus on this product. Regulations. So the majority of industries have some type of product regulation for safety, for testing, for compliance that you need to bake into your methodology. You may be able to test yourself for that or you may have to have your product go out to a third party to be certified. So those are all important things to understand in the market and the class of product you have. What are the regulations that govern it and how do you get those into your methodology? And then finally support. So some products like a food, you eat it and it's gone. Other products have a long lifespan. Lifespan might be a year, lifespan might be 40, 50 years in the case of a plane. So thinking about how you're going to support and upgrade and maintain the product through time will factor into the methodology you have. With that, let's wrap up with the learning check.